Sometimes it's crazy to think that while we're all watching this video on some kind of device which is connected to the internet, to satellites that are learning all about you through algorithms, there's other human beings same as us that don't even know the rest of the world exists beyond their small isolated part of it. But they do, and their way of life can be shocking to the rest of us in some ways. From the tribe that really, really didn't want to hear about Jesus to the real life cannibals, here's the 20 scariest tribes you don't want to mess with. <sighs> Number 20. Mercy. In the African country of Ethiopia, there's a group of people called the Mercy. Their women are known for their huge lip plates that they wear as a form of decoration. They're one of the last African tribes to still wear traditional clothes and accessories. They live in the remote Omo Valley. A Mercy's girl's lip is cut open when she's about 15 years old, and a kind of plug soaked in water is put in until the wound heals. Then the woman decide how big they want the plate to be and start the stretching process. It hurts a lot, and it takes months for the stretch to get to its full size. It's worn as a sign of beauty and also as a promise to her husband, kind of like a wedding ring. She always wears it when she's serving food to her man. When a woman's husband dies, she stops wearing the lip plates because the Mercy believed that her beauty dies with him. Lastly, the plate is important for figuring out who is from which tribe. It makes sure that Mercy women aren't mistakenly thought to be from a rival tribe, which could get them into a lot of trouble. Anyway, it sounds really fun to be a woman in the Mercy tribe. Before we go on, like this video, smash that subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or the centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. The Sentinelese. The Sentinelese are a group of people who live on North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal, which is in the northern Indian Ocean. They're also called the Sentinelli or the North Sentinel Islanders. They're classified as a particularly vulnerable tribal group, and they're part of the Andamanese people as a whole. It seems like the Sentinelese have always tried to stay away from the rest of the world, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. They've even people who tried to land or come close to the island. In 1956, the Indian government made North Sentinel Island a tribal reserve, and made it hard to get within three nautical miles of the island. It also keeps an armed guard on duty all the time to keep invaders away. It's even against the rules to take pictures of these islanders. No one knows how many people are in the group, but estimates range from 15 to 500, with most being between 50 and 200. In November of 2018, All Nations, a Christian missionary group based in the U.S., trained and sent John Allen Chow, a 26-year-old American, to North Sentinel Island. His goal was to meet and live with the Sentinelese in order to convert them to Christianity. They had been doing fine without Christianity for quite some time, but oh, okay, yeah, sure, try. He tried to sing them praise songs and talk to them in Rosa, but they didn't answer. When he tried to communicate with them in other ways, they laughed. But the laughter didn't last long, and soon they heard enough about Jesus. Later, fishermen saw the islanders dragging Chow's body, and the next day, the fishermen found him dead on the beach. I bet there's a lesson somewhere in there about trying to push your views on other people, but it's not for me to say. Number 18. Caribs. Have you ever wondered if cannibals still exist? On some Caribbean islands, there are still people who eat their own people. Columbus gave the Caribs the name Caribs. Cannaba is another word for Caraba, which means people who eat people, and it's where our word for cannibal comes from. The Spanish conquistadors said that the Kalinago were cannibals who often roasted human flesh and ate it. There's evidence that both the Carib and other Amerindian groups like the Arawak and Tupinamba took war prisoners as trophies and then and ate them as part of a ritual. These guys were not to be messed with. Later, a leader named Chief Cairo Ane and his men from Granada jumped off Leaper's Hill rather than be forced into slavery by French invaders. This is a famous example of the Carib spirit of resistance. In the Carib territory in Northeast Dominica, there's still a small group of about 3,000 Caribs who live there. Number 17, Aztecs. It's not really fair to call the Aztecs a tribe. When the Spanish first made contact with them, the Aztecs ruled a mighty empire. 
they were in many ways far more advanced than the European explorers. At first, they must have seemed undefeatable, but history had other plans for the Aztecs and their greatest weakness was how much they were hated by all the other peoples living in Mexico at the time. Well, that and actually really much more a smaller enemy. A smaller enemy that would reveal itself later. Between 1325 and 1519, the Aztec Empire thrived in the Valley of Mexico. It was the last great civilization before the Spanish came in the early 1600s. The Aztecs, who were also called the Mexica, ruled through a mix of fear, political skill, alliances, and military power. At the same time, the Aztecs were known for being skilled craftspeople, engineers, builders, traders, and farmers. They made colorful, detailed art, huge cities with tall pyramids and big waterways, a highly productive farming system, and a way of writing that used logograms and syllable signs. The Aztecs kept their empire going and fought off other groups with a strong and well-trained military. All Aztec boys were trained for war in special military compounds starting when they were very young. But when the Spanish came, they were no match for them. Now, you may think that's because the Europeans had better military strategies or technology, but the biggest reason is actually that the Europeans were filthy. They didn't have good hygiene habits, and they had a lot of diseases that they brought with them from Europe, especially smallpox, and that's a big reason why Cortes won against the Aztecs. Indigenous people didn't have any immunity to their diseases, so it spread quickly in thousands, paving the way for the Spanish Empire. Number 16. Awa Tribe in Amazon Rainforest about 100 of the Awa's 600 members still live as nomads in the Amazon forest near Brazil's border with Peru. The Awa have been called the world's most endangered tribe. Illegal logging and wildfires put them in near constant danger. This led another tribe, the Guajajara, to become forest guardians to protect them. The Awa are a group of people who have always lived in Brazil. They live in the Amazon rainforest. There's about 100 of them who never talk to anyone outside of their group. People think they're very likely to go extinct because of f and governments who want to cut down the trees in their area. The tribe is nomadic and lives by hunting and gathering. They're also very good at staying alive under normal circumstances. When it's time to hunt for food, kids in the tribe learn from a young age how to make their own bows and arrows and how to hunt. During the 19th century, Europeans who moved into the area the Awa more and more. They also cut down most of the trees on their land. Around 1800, the Awa started to become more nomadic in order to avoid being taken over by Europeans. Oh, that's a really kind way of saying eradicated. Late in 2011, illegal loggers burned to death an eight-year-old Awa girl who had wandered away from her village took place in the state of Maranjo, a protected area. A leader from the allied Guajajaras said that the girl was to send a message to other native people living in the protected area that the illegal loggers were in charge of things now. So one more reason never to buy anything made from rainforest or unsustainable wood sources. Number 15, Papuan in West Papua. West Papua is an Indonesian territory on the island of New Guinea, which is near Australia. It's home to about 312 tribes. West Papua has a lot of military operations, and soldiers and police can kill and torture people with impunity. West Papua is in the western half of the island of New Guinea. It's a colony of Indonesia. It's a different group from Papua New Guinea, which is an independent country. Since Indonesia took control of West Papua in 1963, the indigenous Papuan peoples have had to go through a lot of pain and oppression. The tribal people of Papua are Melanesian. They're different in race, religion, and language from the Malay Indonesians who rule them from Jakarta. The government cracks down on political dissent and tries to Indonesianize Papuans, destroying not only lives, but also amazing cultural and linguistic diversity from more than 300 different tribes. Tribes in the highlands get their food from shifting crops and hunting. They also keep pigs. During military raids, they're too scared to hunt or work in their gardens. Papua's churches did their own investigation and found that during a similar military operation in 1998, at least 111 people died from hunger and disease in just three villages. And women and girls as young as three years old were routinely assaulted by the soldiers. This is one tribe that's greatly suffering at the hands of an oppressive government. Number 14. Mashko Piro in Peru. 
A Mashko Piro clan has suddenly stepped up contact with the people who live along the Alto Madre de Dios River. This comes after years of sporadic and sometimes deadly interactions with this tribe. Cooking pots and machetes disappeared from the clusters of raised wooden homes in the Amazon jungle, about a half hour's walk from the Alto Madre de Dios River. Then, when most of the town's men were helping build a road on the other side of the river, two Moshko groups sneaked into town and stole piles of yuca. The Moshko are one of many tribes in Peru and Brazil that seem to be coming out of isolation. They're often called an uncontacted tribe. Moshko had been showing up more often and being more aggressive, which has led to one death, the evacuation of two villages, and the government getting involved. It's a complicated situation that changes constantly. Any early contact with a remote tribe puts everyone at risk of dying from violence or disease. It's the same concept that we described with the Aztecs earlier. Their immune systems have not been exposed to diseases that they would see if they met up with modern people. So things like the flu, measles, or even just the common cold Cold could be deadly. No one knows why this tribe are now venturing into the regular world, but it's a tricky situation to say the least. Number 13. Palawano The Palawan tribal people are the original people of the Palawan group of islands in the Philippines. They hunt wild animals with spears that are tipped with poison. They catch fish by putting a special root sap into a shallow stream or river and mixing it with water. The tribe didn't keep many chickens or pigs as pets, but dogs were often their favorite because they could also be used to hunt. Most of the time, Palawans don't put sea salt on their food. Their normal diet includes rice, bananas, cassava, vegetables, rimas or breadfruit, fruits, wild pigs they catch while hunting, birds like wild quails and tickling, wild chicken, and freshwater fish. They make a tasty dish called pinyaram for a festival. It's a kind of cassava or rice cake that's served on banana leaves, and it's similar to bibingka in the Philippines. Interestingly, they don't know what year or years are. When people ask them when they were born, they'd point to a tree and say that they were born when that tree was about a certain height. Number 12. Suri people in southwest Ethiopia. Sur is a Pashtun tribe that lives mostly in Afghanistan and Pakistan. People say that they're related to the Ghurids, a dynasty that began in Mandesh, which is in the Ghur area of Afghanistan today. Sher Shah Suri was from the Sur tribe. He started the Suri Empire in India. They ran the empire from 1540 to 1555, when Humayun and the Persian army beat them at the Battle of Sirhind and re-established the Mughal Empire. People from the Sur tribe are now part of the Pashtun tribe and belong to the Lodi Betani Confederacy. Pashtun people are an important ethnic group in eastern Iran. They speak Pashto and they follow Pashtawali code of behavior. They live mostly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they have between 350 and 400 tribes and clans. They have about 49 million people, and they're the largest tribal culture in the world. Number 11, Yanomami Tribe. The Yanomami are the largest tribe in South America, and they live in the most remote area of the continent. The rainforest and mountains of northern Brazil and southern Venezuela are where they live. I don't know if this is still the absolute most up-to-date, but they think that like a lot of tribes on that landmass, they probably crossed the Bering Strait between Asia and America about 15,000 years ago, and then slowly made their way down to South America. The total number of people living there now is about 38,000. The Yanomami territory in Brazil is twice as big as Switzerland, at over 9.6 million hectares. In Venezuela, the Yanomami live in the Alto Orinoco, Casaquare Biosphere Reserve, which is 8.2 million hectares. Together, these areas make up the world's largest indigenous forest territory. In the 1940s, when the Brazilian government sent teams to mark the border with Venezuela, this was the first time the Yanomami had long-term contact with people outside of their tribe. In the early 1970s, the military government decided to build a road through the Amazon along the northern border. Bulldozers drove through the town of Opikithri without giving anyone any warning. Two villages were wiped out by diseases that the people didn't have an immune system to fight. The road brought in colonists, diseases, and alcohol, all of which were very bad for the Yanomami, and these troubles haven't gone away. Number 10. 
Korobo tribe. The Korobo live in the Javari Valley, near where the Itu and Itikwa rivers meet. They're sometimes called clubber Indians because they use battle clubs. I'm hoping that they used to be called that because, like, they're not Indians and clubbers isn't exactly flattering. Around 200 people, or most of the population, still live alone and move between the rivers Itu, Koari, and Bronco. In 1996, a small number of Korobo were finally able to be reached by people from outside their tribe. After they met, the Korobo began to go to Matis Indian camps and settlements in the jungle. The group now lives in two different places on the lower Itu. The Korobo are one of the last groups of people on Earth who live almost completely cut off from modern culture, even though they have had many violent encounters with the villages around them. Even though Korobo isn't their real name, it's what most people call them. In reality, Korobo is an insulting word made up by a tribe that used to be at war with them. The rest of the world then adopted it as a way to identify them. Locals often call them caseteros, a word that a French journalist mistook for head mashers because it sounded like the French phrase casetet. Casetero, on the other hand, just means clubber or man with a club, referring to their weaponry. Much like the nearby isolated people known as flecheros, who are simply archers, and they're just referring to the weapons that they employed too. Number 9. Moken Tribe the Moken are an Austronesian people who live in the Mergui archipelago. This is a group of about 800 islands that Myanmar and Thailand both claim as their own. Most of the 2,000 to 3,000 Moken live as a semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer tribe who depend heavily on the sea, but this way of life is becoming more and more dangerous. The Moken share a culture, and there's 1,500 men and 1,500 women who speak the Moken language, which is its own Austronesian language. Myanmar and Thailand haven't been able to integrate the Moken into the culture of the area as a whole very well. But the Moken don't know what their future will be like because their population's going down. And they live a nomadic life and don't know what their legal status is. Because of this, modern property and immigration laws, maritime conservation and development programs, and tightening border policies push them to the edges of society. Most humans have very poor underwater vision for two different reasons. In water, both the eye's curved cornea and the lens inside the human eye don't work very well. Moken children, on the other hand, can see while free diving to collect clams, sea cucumbers, and other things. Their spatial resolution is more than twice as good as the control group, which means they can see significantly better underwater than European children. A potential amazing example of human adaptation and evolution, and in future, these people might even evolve to become a semi-aquatic people, which is not very likely, but could be pretty awesome. But obviously, none of that could happen if they aren't allowed to survive and prosper in peace, something which looks unlikely at the moment. Number 8. Yaifo Tribe in Papua New Guinea the Yaifo are a small, isolated group of people who live in the East Septic province of Papua New Guinea's highlands. The tribe is one of the most isolated in Papua New Guinea, and not many people have ever seen them. They're one of the few tribes on Earth that doesn't have contact with the rest of the world. In 1988, an explorer named Benedict Allen first went to see the tribe. In November of 2017, it was said that Allen had gone missing while trying to plan a second trip to the tribe. He was later found safe and sound. When he first met the tribe, he wrote that they gave him a, quote, terrifying show of strength and a lively dance in which they showed off their bows and arrows. Allen's expeditions are unique in that they're done without Western guides, a phone, or GPS. Instead, he relies on local help as much as possible, instead of the usual help from the outside world. Allen said, To me personally, exploration is not about planting a flag, or conquering nature, or going somewhere in order to make a mark. It's the opposite of these things. It's about opening yourself up, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, and allowing the place to make its mark on you. Number 7. Korowai even though the idea of living in a treehouse as tall as the Statue of Liberty sounds pretty scary, these amazing structures are very strong and well-built, and they're made to keep its residents safe from all the dangers in the area. The 
The tree house is on the New Guinean island of southeastern western Papua, which has few people and many hills. The first time the Korowai people met people from other places was in the 1970s, when Christian missionaries went to the island. The missionaries found this amazing architecture that kept up to 20 tribes people and their animals safe from a forest full of giant spiders, venomous snakes, and insects that could kill them. Also, the tribes here are some of the last in the world to practice cannibalism. The treehouse is even set up with a simple alarm system that lets the people inside know if hungry looking rival tribes people are climbing up. Number 6. Aorio. The Aorio are a people who have always lived in the Grand Chaco. They live in the area between Bolivia and Paraguay, where the Paraguay, Pilcomavo, Parapet, and Grande rivers meet. In the 1720s, the Jesuits started the San Ignacio Zamuco mission to convert the Iorio to Catholicism. This was the first time that the Iorio ever met other people. In the 1740s, the mission was closed and the Iorio were left on their own until the 1900s. The Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay from 1932 to 1935 brought 100,000 soldiers and new diseases to their lands. The Iorio were designated a problem for both countries, and from the 1940s until the 70s, Paraguayan soldiers could get out of the army free for killing an Ioreo. The Ioreo struggle with poverty and prejudice, especially in cities. There aren't many opportunities for young Ioreo people, and they need scholarships so they can go to schools and get out of poverty. Members sometimes have to beg or sell their bodies to stay alive. Ioreo prostitutes have a high chance of getting HIV, and sometimes they hide it and don't get treatment because they don't want to be judged by their community. Number 5. Asmat Tribe The Asmat are a group of people from New Guinea who live in the Indonesian province of South Papua. The Asmat live in the part of the island's southwestern coast that's next to the Arafura Sea. They get the materials for their canoes, homes, and wood carvings from the area, so their culture and biodiversity are very tied together. Because their land floods every day in many places, the Asmat usually build their homes two or more meters above the ground on wooden posts. In some inland areas, the Asmat used to live in tree houses that were sometimes 25 meters above the ground. Asmet art, like the BC pole, is made of intricate stylized wood carvings that are meant to honor ancestors. The world's museums have a lot of Asmat artifacts. Two of the most famous are the Michael C. Rockefeller collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam. Headhunting raids were a big part of Asmat culture until missionaries stopped them. However, some accounts say that these practices continued until the 1990s. The death of an adult, even if it was caused by disease, was thought to be the work of an enemy, and family members tried to take a head in a never-ending cycle of revenge and appeasing the dead. The rituals that Asmat boys went through to become men required hunting ahead, as well as aspects of cannibalism. Number 4. Agori the Agori are a group of Shivite sadhus who live as monks in Uttar Pradesh, India. Most Agori live near places where people are cremated, most famously in Varanasi. Still, they can be found in much more remote places, such as the cold caves of the Himalayas, the thick jungles of Bengal, and the hot deserts of Gujarat. Agoris believe that you can find freedom by doing things that are forbidden in traditional Hinduism. They also think that if these practices are done right, spiritual growth can happen more quickly. The way of the Agori is not for people who are easily scared, because if you don't do your practices right, you might risk getting even more stuck in the wheel of life. Cannibalism is one of the most well-known things the Agori do. It's important to know that the Agori don't people intentionally to eat their flesh. Instead, they eat the flesh of bodies that are brought to the crematorium to be burned. They often eat this raw, but sometimes they roast it over an open fire. Another thing the Agori do is not wear clothes. Agori often wear nothing but a loincloth, and sometimes they just go around naked. The practices of the Agori are very strange and extreme, and most Hindus would almost certainly not agree with them, but their culture is very fascinating and complex. Number 3. Mudmen Asaro Tribe 
The mud men of Papua New Guinea, who are from the Asaro tribe and are also called the Halosa, wear traditional clothes that focus on mud masks. They live in Papua New Guinea's eastern highlands province near the town of Goroka. Anthropologist Todd Otto said that there are as many versions of the creation legend as there are sources. In the Asaro Mudmen's oral history stories about how they came to be, they covered all the bases about their ancestry, it seems. The people of Papua New Guinea thought that the mud from the Asaro River was bad for them, so when they encountered the Mudmen, they were terrified of these people who could withstand the toxic river mud, leading to the belief that the Mudmen were spirits. You may laugh, but it's no weirder than a white guy in the sky that made everything in a day. Number 2. Batak The Batak have lived in a way that combines hunting and gathering, with planting useful food plants, a slash and burn farming method, and trading for hundreds of years. For many centuries, the Batak traded with the seafaring people of the Sulu area. Before the Americans came in in the last few years of the 19th century, the Batak were mostly left alone. The reason for this was that the Bataks lived on the edges of mainstream political and cultural life in the Philippines. From the middle to the end of the 20th century, immigrant farmers, mostly from Luzon, forced the Batak to leave their favorite places by the sea and move to the mountains. They try to make up for the fact that they now lived in less fertile areas by collecting and selling non-wood forest products like retail on tree resins and honey. The government and commercial collectors are not happy about this. They say that the Batak have no legal right to these resources. Conservationists, on the other hand, are interested in Batak's way of collecting, which are much better for the environment than the methods used by governments and corporations. Number 1. The Cargo Cult The most well-known time for cargo cults was during and after a small number of native Melanesian people observed the biggest war of all time being fought by countries with advanced technology, which often took place right in front of their homes. During the war, Japan gave out supplies and used the Melanesian spiritual beliefs to try to get them to do what they wanted. The huge amounts of military equipment and supplies that both sides airdropped, or airlifted to airstrips, to troops on these islands caused big changes in the lives of these islanders, many of whom had never seen out outsiders before, let alone the technology of the middle 20th century. This was also true of the Japanese army at first, before relationships worsened, in an example of a cargo cult worshipping cargo. The John Frum cult started on the island of Tana in Vanuatu. This movement began during the and later turned into a cargo cult. Some cult members worshipped an unknown American with the name John Frum, or sometimes Tom Navy who they said had brought cargo to their island during and who they thought was a spirit that would continue to bring them cargo in the future. How should we treat these tribes in the future? What kind of changes can we make to improve their lives, whether they're contacted or uncontacted? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!